So uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, it is a beautiful summer day here in Ottawa, and I hope that you are also enjoying some beautiful summer weather, wherever you may be. Thanks everyone for joining us today for this webinar on preparing plain language summaries. If we haven't crossed paths before, I'm Rachel Maxwell, the Executive Director here at Evidence for Democracy. And I'm still, as I say all the time, but I'll, I'll say it again, I'm still fairly new here in my, in my tenure at E4D. But I must say that coming on board when we have really timely work like this going on, not to mention the great team behind it all, uh, has made my initial months at E4D really exciting. Um, before we get started, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're delivering this session on from today. As I mentioned, I'm joining from Ottawa, which is located on the traditional unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. While we take a moment to acknowledge this, let's all recognize the history and continuation of colonialism on this land. For all the settlers on this call, let's think about the benefits that we experience because of colonialism and how we can do our best to respect and stand in solidarity with those who were here first. I know many of you are joining today from different places, so we'll also share a link in the chat to Native Digital, sorry, Native Land Digital with you. Native Land Digital is a nonprofit that has created a map to show Indigenous territories, treaties, and languages. And it's a really helpful tool for understanding more about the different lands in Canada. And I encourage you to take a minute to explore that today or whenever you might have a chance. Now, I'd also like to take a moment to introduce our presenter for today, Farah, sorry, Farah Quasar. Farah is a force all unto herself and hardly needs an introduction, um, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyways. Farah is a researcher and science communicator who recently finished her Master of Science degree at the University of Toronto. During her studies, she co-founded the Toronto Science Policy Network. And these days, in addition to everything else that she's involved in and contributes to, she also serves on the inaugural Youth Council of Canada's Chief Science Advisor. Farah joined Evidence for Democracy this past winter as a researcher to lead a project on plain language writing. And this is thanks to a collaboration with the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada. The work that's being presented here today is actually an adapted version of that work for a public audience. So in terms of our topic today, uh, I'll go out on a limb here and say that if you weren't already a fan or advocate for plain language summaries, the pandemic has likely made you one. Um, you know, as many of you will know and, and, and acknowledge, so much research involves very dense, very technical components, and science can really feel like its own incomprehensible language at times. So this technical language is not usually accessible to non-specialist readers, which can leave people feeling like they're fumbling around in the dark when they're trying to understand scientific insights. Further compounding this, there really isn't a standardized set of tools or practices out there to help guide public communication in ways that make science comprehensible and useful to different audiences. So this is where plain language can help. And rather than steal of any forest thunder here, I'm going to leave my remarks there. But one quick thing before turning it over to Farah, just a couple housekeeping remarks. Please feel free to use the chat feature throughout the presentation today. You can drop any questions you have for us in there, or you can submit the questions via the Q&A function. We will be monitoring both, and there is time for questions at the end. Excuse me. So we'll keep an eye on those and get to as many of your questions as possible. We do also have auto-generated captions turned on today. If you would prefer to not have those showing up, you can turn them off by clicking the closed captioning bot button at the bottom of your screen and selecting hide subtitles. Following the webinar, uh, you will receive a copy of the recording. I was already asked, um, but we'll mention it again. Um, and a copy, I believe, of the new Plain Language Summaries Toolkit. Um, so I'll leave it there. Without further delay, I will pass it over to Farah. Take it away. Thanks so much, Rachel. And I feel like you did steal a little bit of the thunder, but that's all right, because I think we can all see the importance of plain language today. But just to ask everyone, 
I'm curious, have you ever read the abstract or an executive summary of a scientific manuscript and just felt a little confused? Feel free to say yes, no, or maybe in the chat and share an opportunity or two where you felt very confused. And I mean, personally for me, I have felt very confused throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been so many technical terms for us all to learn about, are not, flatten the curve. Do you remember flatten the curve? And just keeping up with just this ongoing rush of information that keeps coming out and trying to navigate all of this public health guidance. And as Rachel mentioned, none of this is new, that research often involves so many high level technical components that it's really not accessible to non-specialists. And to complicate matter, matters further, there aren't really a set of standardized tools across different institutions to really help guide public science communication so that it's useful. And we've seen calls for you know, public science communication for science to be plainer. And this has uh, kept going throughout the pandemic. For example, there was this lovely op-ed in the Globe and Mail, which was really calling for the language of public health to be plain and simple. And this can be applied to science. And this is where this idea of plain language can come in. So what is plain language? Well, according to the National Plain Language Foundation, we'd say that a communication is in plain language if its wording, structure, and design are so clear that the intended readers can easily find what they need, understand what they find, and use that information. And often when people kind of hear this definition, they think, okay, so it's kind of about shortening text and maybe substituting technical terms for easier words. But the thing is that plain language is more than just shortening text. As a writer, you're taking responsibility for the work that you're sharing with the reader and you're putting the reader first. You're going to be sharing the same concepts and information that's found in technical writing and with the same level of accuracy, certainty, and precision, but in language that most readers will understand. And that's why we're here today. Thanks to a collaboration with the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, we prepared a 40 page toolkit on how you can prepare plain language summaries. This includes kind of practical tips, examples of how to put those tips into action, as well as checklists. I'm not gonna go through the entire toolkit today, but we really wanted to kind of present the best practices to guide you from beginning to think about writing a plain language summary to all the way of actually writing, actually formatting it, and what to do before submitting with a few examples. I'm going to take a peek at the chat to see what people think. Oh, I can see that a lot of things have been confusing. So I'm glad you're all here today. So I'm going to dive straight in. And before you can start preparing your plain language summary, you have to think about what you want to focus on. And that begins with who is your audience? So a lot of times when I ask people, who are you aiming this text at? Uh, the answer often is the general public. But the thing is, there is no general public. The public is full of many different stakeholders, many different groups who all have different characteristics. They may, be, they may have different ages, they may have different literacy skills, they may be fluent in different languages and have gen different gendered identities and belong to different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so really narrowing down on who you're targeting and who is going to be most interested in your work or who's going to rely on your work is really critical. You want to think about your target audience and think about what are their needs, what are their expectations, and what are their priorities. So for example, if I published a genomics research manuscript, I would kind of think about, okay, my target audience is likely the people with the disorder that I'm working on who want to know what's happening in this field what are the advances? It might also, my target audience might also include doctors and researchers who are working in this field and who want to use my findings to further what they're doing. So I kind of have two target audiences in mind. Your target audience will vary differently depending on what you're writing about, what research you're doing, but it's always good to narrow it down as much as possible. And if you can't narrow your target audience down, then try to write as broadly as possible, keeping in mind the different stakeholders who might be reading your research to make sure that what you're writing is accessible to as many people as possible. The next question you probably wanna ask yourself is what is your purpose? Why are you writing this plain language summary? Is it mandatory? Is it a requirement that you have to tick off? Is it something that you're doing in addition to um, make your writing accessible? And do you have outcomes in mind? So for example, is it because you wanna engage your audience? Is it because you want to prompt a greater level of awareness? 
Maybe you want to provide instructions or explanations. Maybe you want to listen to behavior change. And the reason why I'm flagging this is because uh, depending on your purpose, you might want to structure your plain language summary differently. So you have to kind of keep these things in mind as you're kind of sitting down and brainstorming about what to do. And lastly, you want to think about what to include in your plain language summary. The way I kind of try to approach is with three questions. So the first is, what is the key message you want to share? So what do you want people to walk away with? The second is, what background context is necessary for your target audience to understand their key, your key message? And what is important for your readers to remember? So it's always like, what do you want to share? And what do people need to know to understand what you want to share? And just as importantly, you also want to think about what you don't want to include because nothing dilutes a uh, plain language summary more than just having way too many details. So I'm quoting a plain language handbook here written by Richard Lockman, if I remember. And he pointed out that it's important to weigh the importance of every idea. So kind of asking yourself, does the reader really need to know this? And am I sure the reader doesn't already know it? So through asking yourself these kind of questions, maybe you'll write them down a piece of paper, maybe you're more of a virtual Google Docs person, you kind of start to build a picture of, okay, this is who I want to reach, this is what I want to share, and this is what I think I should include. And once you've kind of checked off these key items, you can start thinking about, okay, I know what I want to include, how do I go about structuring it? And for this, you really want to think about how your reader will access and use your plain language summary or document. So as a general rule of thumb, you probably want to aim for your plain language summary to be about 10% of the overall document size. And there are lots of, way you can, lots of ways you can go about structuring your plain language summary. Perhaps you just want it to be an abstract size. Maybe it's just 500 words. Or perhaps you've got a really long report. Maybe it's 100, 200 pages long. And you've got a little bit more flexibility in how you could go about your plain language summary. Maybe you want to go with the typical introduction methods, results, and discussion. Maybe you want to go with an inverted pyramid. So this is something you see in journalism, where it's kind of you start off with the most important information, then you add more details and you go broader. It's kind of you answer the who, what, where, why, when in the first 500 words. You could also go with a chronological order. So perhaps you're just guiding the reader through what happened and just filling them in on details as you go along. And you could also go with a question and answer format where you're trying to predict the questions that the readers have, readers have and use the answers to really drive your plain language summary. To what I'm trying to really say here is that there's no one perfect structure. It's going to vary depending on what type of plain language summary or document you're working on. And it really depends on how you want the document to be used. But what all plain language summaries should have are a few essential elements. So here is a screenshot from Post Notes. So this is a research briefing that was prepared by the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in the UK. You can see that it's about small modular nuclear reactors. And I'm showing you this example to kind of highlight some essential elements. So you should obviously have a very clear title that anyone can kind of point and see, okay, this is what it's about. If it's a longer plain language summary, perhaps you'll want to throw in a summary box. So kind of three to five quick bullet points which summarize what you're talking about. You'll want to have some sort of background, some sort of introductory information to fill in the blanks for people who might not be familiar with your topics, kind of addressing the who, what, where, why, when, and how in the beginning. And you'll want headings to kind of direct people and catch their eye and help them move along the document. And when it comes to headings, there are best practices. So you'll want to aim for kind of two to seven words. And you want to make sure that your title can make sense on its own. You don't want to include abbreviations that you've probably introduced in text, but if someone's skimming the table of contents, they won't know that abbreviation unless they read the actual document. So when I get aim for two to seven words, something that really describes, it's a descriptive heading rather than just a functional heading of introduction and methods. You should avoid overly technical words. And in general, the titles of programs or policies do not form good titles. The example that I'm showing here on the slide is a screenshot from an environmental impact statement by the Labrador Island Transmission Link Project. And you kind of see they've, they've skipped the whole introduction methods, results, typical headings. They've gone for more informative headings. So things like need and purpose of the transmission project rather than just saying aims. They've thrown in things like operating and maintaining the transmission project instead of just operations. So just simple little tricks like this can make your plain language summary like 
make it easier for readers to navigate and find the information they need. And then we actually come to the meat of the bones, which is writing your plain language summary. So there are many best practices. I've boiled them down to three, but there's more. The first one is to write the way you speak using a conversational tone. So that means avoiding overly formal or bureaucratic terms, um, not being overly formal, not making sentences more complicated than they really need to be. The next one is to kind of reduce the use of jargon. So do you really need to use that jargon or that technical term? Or is there a simpler word or a word that your audience is more familiar with that you can substitute in? And sometimes it's not always possible to reduce jargon. Sometimes you have to use that jargon. And in cases like that, you want to lead your audience into understanding with an extended definition. So perhaps you point out that, hey, thermite reaction is a thing and this is what it's used for, rather than just diving in and assuming that people know what that specific reaction is. Another example is to make sure that you, to remember that words have different meanings depending on the reader or the context. So as an example, the word significant. As a scientist, like when I see the word significant, I assume that a statistical test has been done. There's a p-value and you know, the finding has reached some sort of threshold. But in lay language, significant just means important. So if I see the word significant in a regular newspaper article, I'm just gonna assume, okay, this was important. I'm not thinking about statistical tests. So you wanna double check that different words that you're using actually don't have different meanings in different contexts. And of course, don't use an abbreviation unless you plan to use it repeatedly. I don't know if you've ever read an abstract where you, or you read an introduction and you just, by the end of the introduction, the sentences are just packed with abbreviations and you have to keep going back to remember, wait, what did that abbreviation mean again? So you don't wanna use an abbreviation unless you plan to use it repeatedly and even then, if it's not a common abbreviation, you should avoid it. So for example, I keep saying plain language summary in this webinar. PLS is not really a common abbreviation and that's one of the reasons why I'm avoiding it. There are more uh, best practices when it comes to plain language summary. So things like thinking about your general writing style and tone, uh, thinking about how to effectively use words, how to share technical information, how to write sentences, paragraphs, and sections effectively. If I went through it all, it would probably be a little boring. So instead, I've kind of shown two examples that can show how you can put some of these best practices into action. So this here is a paragraph from an environmental assessment report in 2018. It's talking about the common nighthawk, how it's an aerial insectivore, and I will read out this paragraph. So it says the common nighthawk is an aerial insectivore whose breeding success depends on the abundance and diversity of insects. Contrary to what the proponent reported, Environment and Climate Change Canada stated that artificial lighting may have adverse effects on insects and result in the fragmentation or decline of populations of certain species that serve as prey for the common nighthawk. So that paragraph is only two sentences. And that second sentence is I think about 50 to 60 words, that's long. You want to aim for your sentences to be around, I think it was 15 to 20 words, and that's pushing it. And you want to make sure that when a person is reading the sentence, it's easy for them to follow along, and they haven't forgotten the main point of the sentence by the time they reach the end. So if I was rewriting the sentence, this is what I would do. Uh, I would actually ditch the word aerial insectivore. When I saw the word aerial insectivore first, I thought like, maybe this is, maybe this bird only feeds on flying insects. But the real, uh, mat what the term actually means is that the common nighthawk is a bird which feeds on insects while flying, like a little distinction. And then for the second sentence, I split it in two because it was just long and I pointed out, okay, the part that says whose breeding success depends on the abundance, I flipped it into the nighthawk's ability to reproduce depends on the number of and the diversity of insects available. Uh, another thing was proponent. I don't know if everyone's familiar. Proponent just is referring to like the company that was proposing this project. So I just said, let's use the word company. We don't have to use proponent. I decided to ditch Environment and Climate Change Canada just to go with experts. I'm trying to aim for the plain language summary to be a summary. And just pointed out that you know artificial light may negatively impact the insects that the nighthawk feeds on. So kind of, it was really about sitting down and um, figuring out okay, what is the most important information that people would want to read, 
And if they want all the extra details, they can definitely head to the actual text. But I'm trying to co convey that same importance information without losing too many of the nuances and in plain language. But as I pointed out, like sometimes you have to use the jargon. So here's a second paragraph from a drilling projects environmental impact statement and it's talking about marine assemblages and how they represent a community of organisms whose physiological, morphological, and life history requirements are adapted to coexist within a specific environment in an ecosystem. Again, that's a really long sentence. And this is a this is something kind of unique. I didn't pick sentences just to kind of pick the worst. Like this is pretty common in scientific manuscripts or technical reports but we can do better. So well, for this uh, paragraph, I know that we need to keep marine assemblages. It's kind of a critical jargon term for this paragraph. But uh, instead what I did was, I can't really picture where marine assemblage is and I don't know if a reader would either. So I'm gonna give a specific example. I point out that, hey, marine assemblages are organisms found in the same area at the same time, such as parasites found in sharks. So I've kind of given people a picture. It's like, okay, I know what that looks like. I can kind of picture it. And then I pointed out these organisms have adapted their body structure to coexist within a specific environment. So still using the same jargon, but just taking the time to make sure that the reader understands it. I decided to go with painting a picture in their head because I think it's easier for people to follow along if they have an image. Uh, perhaps you might actually throw in an image. I think that would also be pretty useful. Wait. And then we come over to formatting your plain language summary. So we've thought about who our audience is. We've thought about how to structure our writing. We've done the actual writing in plain language. And now it's not just about loading it up in a Word, Microsoft Word or Google Doc document and just sending it over, but you should also take some time to think about how you wanna format your plain language summary so that people can easily navigate the document. And this involves using typographical elements of so things such as fonts, headings, font sizes, maybe margins, justifications, white space, thinking about bullets and numbered lists and tables and figures. And none of this is new. I'm sure all of you have worked with all of these elements before, but it is important to kind of take a minute to really think about how to use these effectively. So for example, generally the recommended advice is that you should use sans serif for headings and a serif font for paragraph text. Serif are like the little things that stick out if you think of Times New Roman. That was not a good example, but uh, you'll notice that I've actually used a sans serif font for both the heading and paragraph text here. Uh, you should use bold underlining, capitalization, and italics for emphasis, but you should use it sparingly because huge blocks of text that are in italics are actually not very easy to read. They're not very accessible. So you want to use it very sparingly and just for emphasis. If you're constantly bolding throughout a document, uh, people will not, it won't grab the reader's attention as quickly. Uh, they'll just start ignoring it because you're using bold so often. Another important thing is to use white space to break up blocks of text. You'll kind of see that my slides are very wide and open and you'll see some examples in the next few slides and how to use white space effectively. And when it kind of comes to lists, you wanna group two to eight items. Uh, you can pick between numbered or bulleted. Numbered lists is generally if, like, if chronology matters, bulleted is if, you, if it doesn't matter as much and you're just listing a discrete different ideas. And of course, with any figure or table you use, you wanna include a clear title, you wanna use a short descriptive caption. This is all, these are all things that you've probably encountered um, in whichever career that you're pursuing. It's not new information, but using it all effectively really does make a difference. And let me give you an example. So this here is a screenshot of the NWT Environmental Research Bulletin. They prepared a two-page bulletin which talks about how this particular research project, a community monitoring initiative, found increased salmon in this area. And just to point out how they took advantage of this two page space, they used bullet points to break up text. So they didn't decide to kind of stuff it all into two paragraphs. They use a question and answer format to really guide the reader's attention to different parts of their document. They use lots of white space. They have lots of white space. It doesn't feel like it's crowded. They've got some colors some captions and some labeled axes. And they've also included like any recommended readings and context. Like, this is a page that I'd be perfectly fine with reading and it doesn't feel stuffed or overpowering to me. 
And lastly, before submitting your writing, it's obviously important to proofread and field test your documents. So as you proofread, you should consider how each word sent, you should consider each word, sentence, and paragraph carefully from the reader's point of view. So is that word really necessary? Does that sentence make sense? Does that paragraph fit here or does it go below or afterwards? Sometimes proofreading, like maybe you'll want to print it out and read it out loud. Maybe you want to use the read aloud function on your laptop or computer. Or maybe you just want to flip to a bigger screen or a different uh, device to look at it. Um, usually looking at something in a different medium or platform makes a difference. And you also want to take some time to field test your document. So it's this idea that you're taking your document and you're either sharing it with a member of your target audience or someone who's just outside your field of expertise to review the text. Because you might not be able to catch mistakes just because you spent so long working on this document and you're very familiar with it and you'll just be like, ah, yes, that paragraph there, that paragraph there. And you've not, you're not be, uh, in that kind of headspace to catch mistakes as often. So when you're field testing a document, you wanna ask open-ended questions. You wanna check that your document is useful and readable. So you might wanna ask readers, hey, could you describe the key concept in your words to see if they picked up on the key messages you were trying to share or whether they were able to use the document to find the answers they were looking for. So putting it all together, what can plain language summaries look like? Well, there are like plain, it might be a simple plain language summary. Maybe it's a paragraph, maybe it's a blog post, maybe it's kind of a newsletter. So there are many different forms. Um, I've shared two examples in the next few slides to give you a sense of what it can look like. So this here is a blog post. It's been written by authors who published a manuscript in the Canadian Science Publishing uh, Facets Journal. And it's talking about how lab fish exposed to diabetes to a diabetes drug show few effects. Um, let me see that. Okay. So if I take a look at their first paragraph, it says that metformin is a pharmaceutical drug widely used to treat diabetes in humans by lowering glucose production. And they're saying that it's doses of 500 to 1000 milligrams daily and it's excreted by kidney production, by the kidneys in the urine. It's a pretty straightforward paragraph. There's, they're using very simple language. They've clearly pointed out, okay, this is the drug. This is what it does. This is how it's used. And they've really captured the who, what, where, why in their first paragraph. And if you just take a look at the rest of the blog post, you can see they've got the actual picture of the fish so people can kind of imagine the fish as they're reading through uh, this blog post. They've got a graphical abstract, which kind of summarizes what the manuscript is about. And just the entire text is very straightforward. It's written in simple language. And these kind of plain language summaries are slowly showing up in some more academic journals. So FASIS here is an example. Another example is CMAJ, the Canadian Medical Association Journal. I hope I've got their abbreviation right. But yeah, this was a really well done piece. Another example is one that I've already showed you, but now you can see the first and second page. So this is a two page bulletin, which kind of walks you through the findings from a community monitoring initiative. And similar to what I pointed out last time, just notice how there's a lot of white space. They've decided to use a question and answer format. So they're asking, why is this research important? What are we doing? What did we find? And really using the questions to drive uh, their plain language summary. They've got photos, so kind of humanizing the people who are doing the work. They've got the, they've picked one figure, not two or three, but they've just picked the one that they think is the most important to share. And just, I like this one. There's a lot of white space and it's very clear and easy to navigate. So I hope that so far I've kind of shown you that plain language is more than just shortening text. And it takes time. It takes time to take your technical writing and then condense it into language that most readers will understand. And it's not something that you'll get right once or twice, but it's a skill that you'll build over the years. And just to end, I will point out that our toolkit includes more best practices and more examples to help you guide through this. And what we're really hoping for is to kind of push towards um, the language of science being more simpler and plain. So much of scientific research is funded by the public and it should be accessible to the public. And as stewards of public funds, we uh, kind of bear the responsibility of making sure that our science and the information that we're learning in our labs and the fields are accessible to all. 
I could go on about this forever. So Rachel, I will pass it over to you. Hi, thanks Farah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, lots, of, lots of comments and questions in the chat. Um, just wanna say, I am so pleased to see such an incredible turnout for this talk. We have over a hundred people on this webinar today which is just fantastic. Um, so a couple of things far that you may not have uh, caught since you were focused on, on delivering the presentation, but people very, very much like your comment around there is no general public. <laughs> so consensus around that. Um, but I also wanna say, as I was listening to you just now get, give, give the overview, this, kind of writing always reminds me of there I think the quote is actually by Mark Twain it's something like I'm sorry or I, I'm sorry for writing such a long letter I didn't have time to write a short one um you know and it's which it, which always makes me laugh because actually writing shorter more concise clear text is actually very challenging I think they're there is, you know, sort of an art form, uh, art form there. So like Farah mentioned at the end there, it takes time, it takes practice. Um, so I uh, wish you all luck in, in your practice of plain, <laughs> plain language writing. I Do will also just add that like, these are all best practices and you can choose to kind of implement which ones you feel are appropriate because like real life constraints, time, resources, how much, uh, energy you have at the moment too like that's all going to decide what it's going to turn out to be in the end. yeah 100 percent. and just before i get to some of the questions and and comments here i will say for any of you wondering yes farah is our resident plain language checker now on all things e4d it's a fantastic resource to have on the team um okay so let me get into some of the questions um far there are a few different questions and comments around accessibility um so i'll just i'll ask this one question um in terms of formatting info uh around the fonts um we have one participant saying that this doesn't exactly match what she's heard recently about text and font uh re in regards to accessibility um mm -hmm. do you know how well the suggestions you covered there actually fit with accessibility, uh, particularly for screen readers. Mm -hmm. So about accessibility for fonts, there's some conflicting research. So some research, recent research shows that you should actually stick to sans serif fonts because they're easier to read for folks who have reading disorders, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of back and forth. What I found important is kind of prioritizing accessible fonts. So a font that can actually differentiate between different letters and numbers. So something like lowercase l, capital I, and the number one. So if you're using a font, I would say double check those three. Mm -hmm. Can your font actually differentiate between the three? And specifically for screen readers. So if you're using images, make sure you're using alternative text or alt text. So you're describing what that image or GIF shows, whether it's social media or whether it's producing a document. If you're using something like Adobe InDesign, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, they all have the option to fill in the alt text for an image. And you can make sure that if a screen reader is going through a document, it can actually pick up and, and you know uh, describe what that image is. Uh, other things to keep in mind in terms of accessibility, you wanna think about being inclusive in your writing. Don't assume pronouns. So um, often kind of the default is to zoom in examples, you know, it's a he, it's a him, but you can also use she, like, go ahead, put women first, or you can go with they, they. Uh, you can also go with gender neutral names, the so kind of Alex or Sam. So there are a lot of different ways to address accessibility. We do actually touch upon it in the toolkit. Um, but if you have more specific questions, I'm happy to dive in. That's great. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, I, I, I apologize if we don't get to all your questions and comments because there are many. Um, so I'll move over to the chat here. Do you think it is acceptable to sacrifice spec specificity of language to improve the understanding of your target audience? Mm -hmm. I think it's a balance. 
And it comes down to how much space you have to write your plain language summary. If mm -hmm. there aren't any space constraints, you can rewrite your entire document or your entire abstract in plain language and keep the specifics. But usually you find that plain language summaries are either short or maybe they're a sum there's meant to be a summary. You won't be able to capture everything. So I think it's a balancing act and you have to decide what are the most critical specific details that you want to keep. Uh, if you can include all of them, more power to you. If you can't, uh, pick which ones are critical for the reader to understand your key message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Um, you touched on this at the end, um, but I'll, I'm going to ask it uh, as a standalone question. Uh, just if you want to expand on anything you did mention there. Would you or do you recommend that every scientific article should be obliged for, for example, in its publication in peer reviewed literature to include a plain language summary? This might make science more accessible. I don't know if making it obligatory or mandatory is the right approach, but I think it's a useful one. I think having a plain language summary to complement every manuscript will just make it easier for people who are complete, who are non-specialists, just scan an article and say, hey, I think this is interesting. All right, I'm going to make the effort to write, to read the whole thing. So I think it's useful. And a lot more journals are beginning to use it. So as I mentioned, there's the Canadian Publishing uh, Canadian Science Publishing's facets journals, there's CMAG, there's things like the American Geophysics Union, Geology Union, AGU, it's one of them. So it is beginning to happen more often, but the thing is, as authors, you do have um, more power in this option. So you can choose to ask the editor in charge of your manuscript, can I publish a plain language summary? And most of the times, like I'm beginning to see that, you know, journals are trying to incorporate more social media usage, more clarity around the papers they're publishing. So sometimes they ask like, can you write a plain language tweet to share your papers? So I don't think a plain language summary is pushing it and you should definitely try to incorporate them where possible. And I should also too, I've published manuscripts and I have not included plain language summaries yet, but that's also something I'm trying to get better at. That's great. Um, this is this is sort of a fun fun one. It's really you specific. Um, but uh, somebody's asking, how did you get so good at this, Farah? <laughs> I have been writing about science for a while. I it started for me in undergrad. I was elected to become the feature section editor for my campus newspaper. So I was interviewing professors, graduate students, undergraduate students about the research they were doing. And I was just pursuing my undergrad degree. So for me, while I was doing all these interviews, I really had to go and read these papers to understand what they were doing. And when it came to me writing the newspaper pieces, like I would have to write it in plain language for myself because unless I could break it down into words that I could understand, I didn't feel like the reader would understand. So that's kind of become my approach for everything now. So every time I'm writing, whether it's for a media outlet, whether it's a report, whether it's a policy analysis, like if I can't understand it, and when I mean me, I mean literally in plain language that I could read before I'm going to bed kind of thing, then I don't think it's accessible enough. So mm -hmm. it's definitely been years of practice. Like if you saw the first few newspaper articles I wrote, they were completely in red because my editors tore them apart. So I think it definitely takes a lot of time and practice. Yeah. We all have to go through that red document process <laughs> to get better. Um, there's a question, I'll, I'll just address this one. Um, uh, somebody asking if, uh, if you, if, excuse me, if you all have access to the toolkit after this and if it's okay to share with your teams and others, yes, yes, and yes, um, you will, You'll get a copy of everything that's been presented here and we strongly encourage you to share it with others who you think would find find this toolkit um, and information here useful um let me just i spotted a question in the chat about a resource for accessibility 
Mm -hmm. uh, there is this website called Web AIM. They're mm -hmm. very focused on accessibility for the web and the virtual world. So if you ever want to check, like, is your font accessible? Does your font look fine on this color? Um, they're a great tool. But mm -hmm. anyway, I'll return moderating to you, Rachel. Awesome. Um, sorry, I'm just bouncing back and forth between the Q&A here. Um, sorry. Are there best practices from empirical research or simply expert opinion? Sorry. Are, are the best practices from empirical research or simply expert opinion and practice? Curious if research I could read that tested different practices against each other. So our toolkit was developed using both empirical research and best practices from experts. If you go to the references section of our toolkit, which is right at the end, there are two pages of every link that we've used. Mm -hmm. And even within the resources that I cited, you can also see them citing the empirical research. So there are a lot of references in there. If you are looking for best, if you're looking for a particular best practice, like you're welcome to email and I can take a look at what the empirical research was. But yes, this was a six foot law project where I have read through a lot of different plain language handbooks and resources. Uh, there was a lot of consensus, but there were definitely some points where some people had a different preference and some people did not. So things like fonts do seem to be undecided right now. Great. Um, I actually think we've got most of the questions. There's some other comments here that I'll just share with you, Farah. So somebody commenting that um, they especially concur with the suggestion to proofread in a different medium. As likely most of us, we now usually compose text on screen and then invariably when printing out a draft, I find ways to improve it no matter how many times I've gone over the text on screen. Mm -hmm. yes. Even for this toolkit, uh, we had kind of prepared the first draft a few months ago and then this week I was rereading and I was just like, oh my God, I can fix this sentence, I can fix that sentence. So time really makes a difference. Like starting with fresh eyes, you can catch more mistakes. Definitely. I don't know if you're in the habit of doing this, but I certainly am. I often read things out loud to myself. That's the other thing. <laughs> I often catch a lot of run on sentences or, you know, variety of, of odd oddities in my writing when I actually hear it being spoken. I don't read aloud my writing as often, but if I'm really struggling with sentence, then yes, I will say it like three times. It's like, what is wrong with the sentence? Why can't you find it? Yeah. Um, there's a few people sharing some reference, some um, resources in the chat here, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else also reads out loud to, her, to, her, to themselves. Awesome. <laughs> read your document backwards. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love that know. one. <laughs> I'm gonna try, I'm, I'm gonna try that one and see what happens. <laughs> um, might be missing, I'm going back to the Q&A here. Um, just following up on the specificity question. Um, so somebody, this is somebody who works in medicine and has ongoing um, debates with with colleagues and bosses. For example, we want to use the term side effects and the boss wants to use adverse events uh, because the boss thinks that the term side effects implies causality. Uh, we, but from their perspective, um, we don't think a lay reader would see this distinction. So what can you suggest for this type of, this kind of jargon issue? Uh, it's very nuanced. So I would first say, try to have a conversation with your co-author. Are they firmly fixed on using adverse reaction versus side effects? I do see their perspective because there is like a difference in nuance. But so for example, if you end up sticking to adverse reaction, that's fine. I would recommend maybe have a sidebar. Maybe you have like a little box which points out adverse reaction means this, it's synonymous to side effects, or you can just explain that in the text. You mm -hmm. should definitely point out that 
like whatever format you decide to choose, definitely point out what does adverse effect mean and probably relate it to side effect in a way. Maybe you'll use a footnote, maybe you'll describe it in text. Because yeah, as I mentioned in the end, uh, your real life Word document is going to be a compromise. It depends on kind of balancing the interests of your co-authors and balancing the interests of your reader and making sure they have the tools to understand. And I think a lot of the times as specialists in our fields, we kind of fixate on words. So I think uh, you might think that adverse effects and side effects is kind of a critical word choice that might make, make or break your document. But the truth of the matter is, I'm pretty sure that your reader will read the document regardless and they'll get through it anyway. It's just the choices that you're making will either make it easier for them to read along or harder. And yeah, I'm sure it is a very critical issue with nuances, but at least from my point of view, as someone who's not immersed in this field, I mm -hmm. think either term would be fine as long as you're taking the time to explain. All right, interesting. Um... I feel like this was maybe this was addressed a little bit in the presentation, but I'll I'll ask the question anyways, just um, so we can dive into it on its own. Do you find using examples helpful, or would that be more for the actual text and not the summary slash intro? I think in I think that's supposed to be intro. Uh, for example, artificial light. Are they referring to traffic or street lights or something else? Is that important? Mm -hmm. It really depends if the artificial light is like a critical piece that the reader is going to keep coming to keep encountering in your plain language summary, then I think it's worth giving an example. But if it's only mentioned in one sentence, artificial light is a common enough word that you can assume that people are thinking of something like a room light or a street light. Right. But for example, in that example I shared about marina assemblages, I pointed out an example is parasites found in shark. It's because this term was going to be keep, was going to keep being used in that report. Mm -hmm. So defining it, giving people an example was useful. Um, you probably want to strike a balance between examples. You want to give it enough examples so that they're helpful, but you also don't want to overload readers with examples. With pretty much every best practice in this toolkit, you want to strike a balance with how much you use and you don't want to overuse a particular best practice. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, I think I think we've covered, there are a lot of fun, great comments and resources being shared in here. So, um, and I apologize if I've perhaps missed a question or something that I can share here with Farah, but I think we've actually addressed um, most of the questions. Can I throw a question to people? I'm curious, has anyone written a plain language summary before? Or is this now something that you want to do for your particular situation? Not seeing any responses. There's got to be somebody on here who's written one. I'm forcing a lot of lab people. <laughs> I'm forcing a lot of people, a lab people, to do it. Excellent. You have to write the report. Yeah, really well, well, it'll come. Others who are saying, yeah, we have to write them as part of reports. Oh, we have an expert, an actual plain language writer, summary writer. Was this webinar? I love Denise. <laughs> <laughs> I've also written a NERB and an RIC. So I don't know what a NERB and an RSC is, which is why abbreviations are not always accessible. What somebody else asked, what is NERB or oh, RSC? Oh, it's the example that I gave. Uh -huh. Oh, gotcha. Not specifically, but I can see the benefits in everyday writing. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, Kathy, also she rewrites plain language summaries for researchers. Ah, oh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Awesome. Um, people still providing some comments there. Um, Even no, if you find that you're not going to be writing plain language summaries, I think this toolkit is still useful as something you can just start incorporating in your daily life. So whether it's plainer emails, uh, more accessible social media captions, it doesn't have to be limited to plain language summaries. Right. Although I would love to see more plain language summaries so that 
every time I see a new paper, I don't just have to go, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, seeing other comments. Yes, I agree, Erwin. Um, this is all great. I think that, um, I think Farah, unless do you have any final words, parting words, you're good. Um, well, I'll just say thank you. Thanks again, everyone for attending today. I, I hope you found it useful um, and that you enjoyed Farah's presentation. I know I sure did. Um, and as we've mentioned, you will be receiving the, the toolkit and webinar, recording of the webinar as a follow-up. Um, so, but of course, um, also feel free to be in touch with us um, at whether through our general account, which is info at evidencefordemocracy.ca or directly with myself or Farah. Our email addresses, I believe, are, are on the website. It's rachel at evidenceforddemocracy.ca and, and Farah at evidenceforddemocracy.ca. We'd love to hear from you. And um, we look forward to hopefully seeing more and more plain language summaries uh, circulating out there in the world. Um, be, it would be great to see, to see more of it. So thanks again, everybody. Bye.